Hello, Sonoma! My name is Zara. I am a feminist, Muslim, Iranian-American comedian. That's where you applaud. Hello, Ted! Give it up for everyone you've seen tonight! I say that I'm Iranian. Some people get scared by this. I like to have fun with it. I like to sit in the front row of nuclear physics classes. <laughs> Excuse me, professor. <laughs> this uh, plutonium. Can you find that on like the Craigslist? <laughs> Excuse me, professor. <laughs> when are we going to make a nuclear bomb? <laughs> because I really, really want one. <laughs> we almost had one. <laughs> I get a lot of questions about who I am. This guy came up to me at a Whole Foods. At a Whole Foods. At a Whole Foods. And he goes, what's a Persian? What's an Iranian? What is that? Why do you have two things? I'm just one thing. I'm just an asshole. <laughs> and then right after that, he was like, what's a spring onion? What's a scallion? I don't understand. One of them is exotic. The other one just says what it is. I'm confused. Why two names? Everyone is against me. Can I trust the CIA? And then he ran for president. Yeah. I'm a comedian. I am a senior fellow on comedy for social impact with an organization called the Pop Culture Collaborative. Yeah, give it up. They work at the intersection of philanthropy, social impact, and Hollywood. And uh, one of the things that I got an opportunity to do is study stand-up comedy for a year. Yeah, it was fantastic. And it made me really think about the reasons why I became a comedian. I get a lot of questions about my career, about how I came to it, about whether or not my parents approve of it. Thank you, one person. <laughs> it's a little strange as a woman entering 40 to still be asked about whether or not my parents approve. <laughs> but give it up for them, they're in the house tonight. And uh, one of the things I realized that I would have to do is I would have to figure out what's funny when I don't find it funny. Yeah. How do we do that? How do we decide what's funny if we're not laughing? And the thing is, for me, this is a really comfortable place to be. I'm really used to living in a constant state of cognitive dissonance <laughs> when everyone else just seems to get it. I think maybe it started with Santa Claus. <laughs> I remember when I was in kindergarten, they dropped me in. I was in ESL. Anybody else English as a second language? No? The rest of you just don't use that half of your brain? That's okay. <laughs> it was right after Thanksgiving, and all the kids are singing these songs, and everybody just knows them. They're going, you better watch out. You know the song. <laughs> He sees you when you're sleeping. <laughs> he knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. I said, uh, who is this man? <laughs> and this little girl with pigtails named Jessica pops out. She was the second Jessica. And she said, oh my God, you don't know Santa? He's just the best guy ever. And I said, no, what does he look like so I can tell my parents to keep an eye out for him? <laughs> she said, well, he's got a big white beard and a robe and a hat. I thought for a second, I said, do you mean Khomeini? <laughs> Ayatollah Khomeini? And she said, well, we call him Santa. I said, what does Santa Khomeini do in America? 
And she said, oh my God, it's great. And then Jessica number two explained, he flies through the sky in a sled led by reindeer. I said, shut up. <laughs> How? And she said, it's magical. I said, what? And she explained everything, the tree, the presents, the chocolate, the elves, the North Pole. And all I needed was a tree. And I ran home, burst through the doors. I said, Mom, Dad, we need a tree. And I just ran to the backyard and just started ripping pine branches off. I'm very resourceful. <laughs> and my dad picked me up and he sat me down and he explained it to me the way any parent might uh, about Christmas uh, with Marxist theory. <laughs> Told me about conspicuous consumption marketing, and about this magical man named Santa Claus who doesn't exist. I started to cry. I said, I want to change my name to Jessica. <laughs> so why do you want to change your name? I said, because then I'll be the third Jessica. I'll be a popular group, and then I can celebrate Santa like everybody else. And he said, don't you know who you are, Zahra? Don't you know what your name means? The day that you were born was the most terrifying day of my life. I learned where babies come from. And in that moment, I felt very connected to him because I also didn't know. And my mom said, she is in kindergarten. My dad said, they just handed you to me, this baby. And they said, what's her name? And I was so overwhelmed. I just opened up the Quran and I put my finger down and it landed on the name Zahra. Do you know her story? When Prophet Muhammad was having his first child, everybody said for sure it would be a boy because they thought boys are better than girls, but it was a girl. <laughs> they nicknamed her Zahra because you brought light into everybody's eyes. You brought feminism to the Middle East. They were bearing baby girls alive before you came. And my mom said, she is in kindergarten. <laughs> but it was too late. The next day at circle time, when it came to my turn, I stood up and I said, my name is Zahra. I brought feminism to the Middle East. <laughs> they were bearing baby girls alive before I came. And there is no Santa Claus. <laughs> that was the first time I learned it's possible to make a teacher cry. <laughs> and I landed in the principal's office where I learned about respecting other people's beliefs. And I tried to explain to the principal, we believe in Jesus too, but Santa Claus is a lie. <laughs> My mom explained to me that everybody celebrates different stories. And so while the rest of you love Santa and you had your presents and the tree and all the stories, I had to wait until fifth grade when you learned about the genocide of the Native Americans and Santa for sure. It took you a while. <laughs> Every now and then in third grade, somebody would be like, I don't know if Santa's real. And I'd be like, Jeff, come here. <laughs> Take a look at this other guy. He looks like Santa too. <laughs> so when it came to evaluating stand-up comedy to see what it's like for people outside of my own experience, this was something that was really secondhand to me, but I had to find a way to articulate it for everybody else. And so I looked at the metrics that we use to evaluate comedy. And we're in an amazing period with comedy right now where we're really questioning whose joke is it? Who gets ownership over the joke, right? And I took a look at some of the things that you know, leave us with a sense of a comedian that we want to say, like, this is it, this is stand-up, and this is a person innovating in stand-up comedy. And what I kept finding was this huge difference in the way that I would have to approach material than a lot of my cis, white, male 
Counterparts, where are you at? We're all the white boys in the house. <laughs> it's too much confidence for me. <laughs> Don't be scared. I own a white man by marriage. <laughs> I'm very happy with him. He is adequate. <laughs> you ever see confidence in a white man? Ooh. Ugh. It's unbecoming. <laughs> it's ugly. My man is adequate. Adequate white boys are like the golden retrievers of the doggy kingdom. Just, <laughs> hey, 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 I just want to play. I just want a friend. One of you, one of you, one of you, one of you. Token, 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 token. <laughs> Who was racist to you today? And I have to train him. You have to train your white man. I have to train him. I have to say, hey, boy, hey, what do you do when it's time to step up? <gasps> you step back, you step back, you step back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, you don't get a treat every time, but good job. You have to say good job. Good job. Everybody say good job to the white men keeping it adequate. <laughs> You're a hero. That's the other one my husband loves. You're a hero. Duncan, you took out the trash. You're a hero. <laughs> Look at these dishes. You're my hero. <laughs> it's a lot of joy in our relationship. And I had to take a look at what's going on for me versus them. And in my now 17-year career in stand-up comedy, whoo, I started in 2003. I you know, kept finding myself just really wanting to quit. <laughs> I don't know if you find this with your jobs, but in my job, I just really wanted to quit, but I couldn't. And I kept wondering, what is it about me that keeps pulling me back in to this vocation? Do, am, I, am I fame hungry? Is that what it is? And I realized in doing my research and looking back on my own experiences as a stand-up comedian, I could say that I started doing stand-up comedy in 2003, but truly, I would say my career began when I was five years old, protecting my mom from hate crimes. My mom wore a hijab in the 80s, back when that told people that you were Iranian and therefore a hostage taker. And uh, I used to break the tension with humor. And also, I felt a kind of authority because people would talk to me and not her. People would ask me questions about her. And uh, I was the fluent English speaker in the family. There was one time where I really lost my temper, though. We were in the grocery store, and this guy came up to us with the same question that everybody was always asking. Why do you hate America? And I thought, my mom must not be doing a very good job because she keeps getting the same question. <laughs> and she and I were in a heated argument over Lucky Charms. <laughs> she said that we couldn't have them because there's pork in Lucky Charms. <laughs> and I said, that's stupid. <laughs> when this guy, this Santa-looking old man walks up with his question for this five-year-old kid on a sugar surge. And he said, Ugh. and I said, we do not hate your country, sir. Now, will you tell this stupid immigrant that there's no pork in Lucky Charms? <laughs> and he said, there is. <laughs> there's pork in Lucky Charms. And then he said, you do not need more sugar. <laughs> Listen to your mother. And remembering back on this, I realized two things. One, I realized why there's lots of Lucky Charms in my apartment. <laughs> but I also realized why I needed this reclamation of my stories. I'm constantly, as a comedian, and as a comedian of color, and as a comedian who's hot in the news all the time, 
People always say, it's your time. Muslim time is all the time. <laughs> it is PR for forever. Now it's Iranian time, okay, until it's Muslim time again. <laughs> and there's this way that I'm tasked with explaining and educating, and oftentimes audiences start to shape my material because they have questions I'm not answering. And the reason why I got into comedy was because I really just wanted to be Corey Feldman. <laughs> not Corey Haim, he always landed with a job of the hero, which meant all of the homework and all of the responsibility. I wanted to be Corey Feldman, who halfway through the movie, everybody was, look at him trying. <laughs> with Ray-Bans. That's what I wanted. I got into stand-up comedy so I could be silly and I could stop talking about politics and stop educating people about me. But that's not what I found. Part of the reason why I start my set every single time with I'm a feminist Muslim Iranian American comedian is because otherwise I found that for my first six years in stand-up, I get this guy after every show. Hey, how come you didn't talk about being Sicilian? Are you not proud? <laughs> I'm proud. <laughs> I'm not allowed to be ethnically ambiguous on stage and not talk about it. There were all these ways that the stand-up comedy club circuit was shaping my jokes. I had to respond to terrorism. I had to respond to whatever was the latest in the news that day. As a young comic, it really limited my material. And I found different tactics to circumventing this, speaking to stereotypes so that I could pivot from them, because then they spoke to the tension in the room. One of the markers of a good comedian is our ability to speak to the tension that's present. But then what do you do when you don't want to? And what I found was, it just made me look like a bad comic. And so I left stand-up comedy. I went into one-person shows, I had a podcast, and there, at least in a one-person show, I could create a context that was centered around what I wanted to talk about. I could talk about my parents, I could talk about wanting to be Corey Feldman. I could talk about my golden retriever good white boy. And on the podcast, without having the Groundhog's Day experience of constantly introducing myself to my co-host, I was able to actually find jokes that I wanted to talk about. And so when I started to look at the way that we write a joke, I noticed there's a difference in the way that I have to craft content than my cis white male counterparts. We all know set up punchline, right? But locked in there is so much. So I took a little professor hat and looked at what is set up really. Here's the thing, in stand-up comedy, it's unmistakable, the experience of an audience in anticipation. There's nothing worse to a comic than a sea of audiences just listening. <laughs> it sucks. Everybody let out a breathless laugh. <laughs> now everybody take a deep breath in. Deeper. Bigger breath. Hold it. Don't let it out. Deeper, 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 hold it. You see what happened? All right, those of you really trooping on, laugh. It's unmistakable. A lot of comedians know when they give you their setup that the joke's already not gonna work. We're already pivoting to our next joke. We have to deliver a surprise. And in order for that surprise to land, you have to have thought we were headed somewhere else. So I realized there's a lot I have to do that's different. I see all these other comedians get up on stage, anticipation, surprise, anticipation, surprise, and they're not responsible for the impact that it leaves. They can just leave. You don't like it? Too bad. It's not your joke, I guess. Daniel Tosh, Louis C.K., that's a little shade. You guys remember when you all liked Louis C.K.? You remember that? 
<laughs> For me, when I get up on stage, immediately everyone wonders, where's she from? Where is she from? And then if I say Iran, bah. If I mention the word Muslim, ah, I have so many questions. And if I don't answer those questions, then you guys don't roll with me. You got to roll with me. And one of the things I found is that we're accustomed to seeing white men on stage with power. That's not new to us. And so we're ready to hear what it is they're going to do with that power. We roll with it. And then we decide how we're left feeling. But with me, when I would get up on stage, I would feel audiences wondering if they were going to give me that authority, wondering if they were going to roll with it. It really slows down a joke. <laughs> when I think of women who take positions of leadership and how we have to root ourselves in a shared context in terms of how you guys see us in that leadership, is it trustworthy? Are we going to roll with her? It changes the joke. And what started to happen to me is that my content then could not take on any other shape than what was immediately necessary for me to respond to on behalf of all Muslims. And then when I came out as bisexual, on behalf of everyone who's bisexual. And then when I said I'm feminist, on behalf of all feminism, on behalf of all Iranians, never on behalf of Corey Feldman. That's all I wanted. And so my message, oh, there we go. My message for all of us here today, collected as audience, is for you to know this. Give your comedian's narrative agency. When you buy a ticket and sit in that seat, let them tell you where they want to go and roll with it. And then in how it impacts you, that's your agency as audience to hold on to those experiences. And that's the job of comedians to then hear you and roll with it. Because when we write a joke, it's for you, and you're here for us. And that's why I love stand-up. Nobody gets to just walk by with a question. It's a conversation. Thank you so much for having me.